Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Story Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report. After more than four decades in the U.S. Senate and months of speculation, Orrin Hatch announces his retirement. How much does this alter Utah's political landscape? What effect will it have on the Washington power structure? And what other candidates are lining up to jump into the race? Utah gears up for the 2018 legislative session. With an already historic number of bills, what will be the major issues? And as Utah's congressional delegation heads back to D.C., what's next on the legislative agenda? Good evening, and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Morgan lyon Cotty, Associate Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Joining us tonight, we have Benjamin Wood, reporter with the Salt Lake Tribune, Natalie Gochner, Director of the Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute, and Damon Kahn, Professor of Political Science at Utah State University. Thank you all for joining us. We've had a lot happen this week, but of course, <laughs> the biggest story, after four decades of service, in his own words, Orrin Hatch says he's hanging up the gloves and he won't be seeking re-election. Natalie, let's start with you. You've worked in state and national politics, often within Senator Hatch's orbit. What are your impressions of this? Well, obviously very big news. Um, I think that it was predictable, in my opinion. I know a lot of people thought he would go again. I never thought he would. Uh, I think it's very hard to walk away from power like he's doing, but it's time and he's a smart man and I think he made the right decision. So in 2012, he said that would be his last race. So Damon, why did we see him coming out and saying that he might be running again? Well, there was a, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in national politics right now. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a time and a position where Senator Hatch was in a place where he was able to be very influential in national politics and to have a voice that would, uh, would be a strong voice for Utah. And we saw that with his being a, a key player in the tax legislation. Uh, we saw that with the uh, changes in the monument designations. And I'm sure that uh, even though he recognized he'd made a commitment uh, six years ago, uh, that, that that weighed on him a little bit. And he needed to do just a little bit more thinking uh, before he made that final decision to step out. Ben, did you think he was serious about running again? Absolutely. And, you know, my colleagues at the Tribune, with their interviews behind the scenes, a lot of people close to Hatch had been telling us that he was very seriously considering another run. So, and this is difficult. He's probably at the highest point of his power. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, let's just put a big double underline on it. Right. You know, I mean. Is he uh, the most powerful elected official you've ever be, seen? It'll be 100 years before we have anything like this again. I don't know if you guys will agree with me or not, but this is a big, big deal, the 40 plus years, but also Senate pro tem. And right. I uh, have been in that office with him uh, in the nation's capital, and it's a very special place, and Utah holds it and we're gonna lose that. And so that idea of being able to punch above our weight class, we are a small state, we're so reliably read usually that sometimes we don't get taken into this national conversation. Is he a part of the, I'm sure he's a part of the reason that we've been able to be so powerful. So how much does this affect Utah and our standing within national politics, Natalie? I, I think it's everything from the big things to the small things. I'll start with the small. The small is that he had a great staff that was very well connected. And if you needed constituent services, Senator Hatch could deliver. You know, if you had an immigration, a visa issue, they were good. So that's, the, that's you know, really personal, but that's small. But on the big things, the big issues of the day, the issues you mentioned, and I think continuing, right, because he's still in office for another couple of years, and he'll, he'll be uh, very important in the DACA discussions, um, the Dreamer legislation, and he'll be very big in the CHIP reauthorization. Right, don't you think, Ben? We would assume, I mean, he's yeah, in a very I mean, powerful position. So he can do the small things and he can do the big things. And I think it's interesting because there's a lot of literature that sh tells you that it's a lot harder to walk away from relevance and power than it is to walk away from money. You know, and he, yeah. he's done it. Well, and we saw this also, and I wonder, Damon or Ben, if you want to comment on this, that Trump was reaching out to him and telling him to run again. So he's retiring despite these overtures from the president. 
Well, Trump uh, has had some challenges finding and keeping allies uh, in the national political scene, even some significant rifts with a lot of senators within his own party, uh, certainly some of them retiring, of course, like Senator Flake. And, and uh, his chief uh, strategist. And, yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Uh, and so uh, for him to find someone like Senator Hatch, uh, who, you know, Senator Hatch has, has certainly had some objections and some, some departures from, the, from some of the things that, that uh, President Trump has been looking to do. Uh, but I, it, it seems like there's been uh, a, a degree of trust there and a degree of confidence where Senator Hatch has been uh, someone who President Trump has been able to work with, uh, um, hiring uh, Rob Porter, former chief of staff, uh, into a position in the White House. From early on, Senator Hatch was someone who was willing to support President Trump. So on, uh, on that level, it isn't surprising to me that President Trump would like to see Senator Hatch continue uh, in the Senate. Well, I would say that relationship has been two directional. The senator was able to get a reduction of the Barriers Monument, Grand Staircase, and the president was able to get tax reform. So both men achieved priorities through that partnership. I will say, though, that I, I, I'm not alone in thinking that it was very unusual how much Senator Hatch aligned himself with the controversial president. Certainly, a powerful person like Senator Hatch could have been more measured in his uh, effusive praise of Donald Trump. Didn't he say that he was the best president he'd ever served under? So why he do you did? think he did that? Especially, well, it's interesting to me in Utah because Trump's approval ratings are not great in Utah, even and, among Republicans. And, and he doesn't share Utah's values in, in at least by any standard I think of, whether it's uh, moral family values, even uh, some of the conservative values that I would think of. And so I find that um, a little surprising from Senator Hatch, and it, it always confused me. I never understood that. Yeah. One thing that's so interesting about this is that he is getting he was getting pressure from Washington DC, but we weren't seeing that same kind of pressure within Utah. And in fact, the polls are very interesting. If you looked at his approvals, they're hovering around 50%, but if you look at those questions should pres or should Senator Hatch run again, only about a quarter of the state and among Republicans, not much higher, wanted him to run again. So there haven't been big controversies. He hasn't really done big things wrong. So why why didn't Utahns want him to run again? I mean, Natalie mentioned Utah values. The numbers show that Utahns are skeptical of career politicians. There's, there's a distaste within the state's voters for politicians who never hang up the gloves, and that seemed to be taking effect. Yeah. And Ben, I think you're right, and this is another part of the um, calculus here that's so strange to me in the Trump-Hatch relationship, because Hatch would be, by some measures, the definition of the swamp, right? I mean, 40 yeah. years yeah. and been through all that. And I realize he was, um, he, you know, changed things and challenged the status quo, but, but uh, isn't it, it's a, it's a tricky thing trying to understand that Trump-Hatch dynamic. Well, well, Hatch has, has been someone who's been willing to forge lots of, of interesting alliances over the course of his 40 years okay. uh, in the Senate, uh, thinking about his relationship with Ted Kennedy. Uh, even uh, if you read, uh, Lee Roderick wrote an excellent biography uh, of Senator Hatch a number of years ago. Uh, and er early on, uh, he reported that uh, that Senator Hatch said, "There's this one guy, Ted Kennedy, who I just I just don't know if I really like this guy." And and yet, over time, as mm -hmm. the relationship developed, he, he he found ways to work with him, and ultimately developed some real respect between two men who were were pretty different in terms of of a wide range of their backgrounds. And I, I think Hatch is a guy who can is is willing to forge those kinds of relationships if they help. Uh, to be able to move forward uh, uh, policy interests well, in the country. And that could be what was going on between him and President Trump, is that he recognized that there are things this country needed, and by you know, aligning with the president, he could get some things done. There's so. certainly those commentators that are pointing out Hatch's ability to maybe be agile, to be able to f be flexible over these last 40 years. Do you think that's part of his legacy, being able to work in that bipartisan manner? Ben? I think we're probably too early to speculate on what his legacy will be. I, I, I would imagine he took a hit with some voters these last couple of years. I mean, like you said, the, yeah. the favorability of President Trump in the state is not as high as it would otherwise be for a Republican president. So I think time will tell whether his alignment with President Trump hurts his legacy in the long run. I will say, though, that we do know that a big part of his legacy is what he did, you know, for the judiciary and for the Supreme Court 
uh, you know, justices because he's been a huge part of that for so many years. Right. Do you think that's the biggest part of his legacy, Could be. just the I, influence there? I think there? it's that, or it's, uh, Senator Hatch seems to think it's, it's religious liberties is a big part of his, Interesting. you know, um, legacy. Uh, but I think, I think Chip is a big deal, and he was, he was very pro-immigration reform and, you know, had done some things for the Dreamers in the past, so I think, Ben, you're probably right. We'll, we, better, we better let the guy finish before we figure out his legacy, <laughs> but, but uh, let's just make no mistake about it. What an incredible man, an incredible legacy of service, and I'm pleased that he made the right decision here, and it'll be fun to see what he does next. Yeah. Well, another aspect of his legacy, too, I think any time a politician says they're running for one more term now, Utahns will say, are they really? <laughs> yeah. I think that will become part of Warren Hatch's legacies, that sort of skepticism of campaign promises. Interesting. Well, and I think a lot of people want to want to point to that history of bipartisan work, the friendship mm -hmm. with Ted Kennedy, as um, as an example of that. But that seems to have shifted in the last decade or so. And more recently, he's been making news for some of these battles that he's waging, especially um, within the Senate Finance Committee recently. The the scuffy the scuffle he got into um, is that maybe part of his legacy as well as as taking on being maybe this outsider and taking on the opposition? I think it is part of his legacy. I think it's also part of the reason he ended up um, uh, politically not having uh, the um not being in a position where it was politically savvy to move forward uh, with the reelection bid here. Um, you know, uh, when he started in the Senate uh, 40 years ago, uh, by many measures, he was one of the most conservative Republicans in the United States Senate. Uh, by the time you get to around 2000, uh, 2006 uh, elections, uh, he's among the most uh, moderate uh, members of the Republican Party in the Senate. And then I think he shifts back, but never really um, never really regains his popularity with the right wing of the Republican Party in the state of Utah, being a little bit distrustful of him, a little bit skeptical of him, uh, and and yet uh, as as the moderates in in the country and and uh, in in the Utah Republican Party shrink and become less common, it becomes more difficult for him to have a sufficient base to be reelected by that group, and so you do see him shift and adapt. Uh, and to be able to do that over the course of 40 years shows better political skill than most senators have, but after a long enough period of time, I think that dynamic catches up with just about everyone. Interesting. So we know he will be retiring, so we are going to need a new senator. So, uh, Ben, maybe you can give us your insights. What are people talking about? I think there's one name that has been said quite a lot this week. There, there is one name, that name is Mitt Romney. And, and it's interesting, an open Senate seat normally would be a vacuum for candidates. Here we are in January and Mitt Romney hasn't even announced his candidacy and he's presumptive winner already. <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange electoral season we're in right now. Was the path sort of cleared for him because of this? Because you're right, normally at this stage in a campaign, this is, I know it's all the way until November, but for a national campaign, we're late and we don't even have a Republican candidate yet. Was the path cleared for him, do you think? It, I think you'd be hard pressed to say it was not. Um, you know, it was so public that not only was Senator Hatch possibly retiring, but that he was looking for a worthy successor in Mitt Romney. Uh, we heard reports of you know, them, their teams negotiating for a, a, a retirement and then an announced candidacy. So those ripples would be felt among the potential candidate pool. There still may be challengers who rise up, and Mitt Romney may or may not even run. But at this point, it seems to be his race to claim. Yeah, Natalie, what's your prediction? Do you think Mitt Romney runs? Uh, I th would be very surprised if he doesn't. Okay. Um, I think we should mention Jenny Wilson is a declared candidate right. and as a smart, savvy, um, experienced, uh, you know, Democrat. And you know, I I think Romney will, if he's in the race, will win, no matter who he runs against. He has that kind of mystique in our state, and I think it's well deserved. Um, he is. You know, you start thinking of the other people. Who, who would they be? Help me here, guys. But Derek Miller, um, Dan McKay is a mm -hmm. is a, a member of the House in the state that I think you know could do this. A lot of people are asking him to. Who are some of the other Speaker ones? Speaker Hughes, perhaps uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. H interesting or the tweets mm -hmm. this week yes. saying that. <laughs> powerful members of the state had actually reached out to okay, him and asked him so, to run. So yeah. I take all those and then I put Mitt Romney right. in there and I think of the level of experience 
um, I think of the profile, and I don't think anyone has a shot at beating him. Well, and I had to laugh earlier this week. Um, McKay Coppins tweeted said, saying, if anybody in the country wants to know what Mitt Romney's chances are, and he actually was retweeting Spencer mm -hmm. Cox, who said, if I was running against Mitt Romney, I would vote for Mitt Romney. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and, he's, and, I, and, and, and I would love to hear your comments on this in covering it, but, you know, the Olympics was such a magical moment for this state. It was sort of our, you know, coming out party for the world. Yeah. And, and Mitt Romney did amazing things. And there were so many volunteers and so many people that worked with him that it, it, it planted a seed in us. And, and we just are, con it's been contagious over these years. Mitt Romney was the most popular political figure in the state of Utah before he was a resident of the state of Utah. <laughs> and so I think it's hard to imagine uh, that he would have a, a terribly difficult time in a Senate election should he seek that position. Well, and I know this is what everybody's talking about, but there are other races in 2018, and this week um, the deadline opened, mm. and we've seen people registering to file to gather signatures, and this is really interesting. <coughs> we already have several dozen candidates for Congress and for the state legislature who are seeking to gather signatures to get onto the primary ballot, and some of these people are individuals who originally opposed count my vote. Natalie, I wonder if you can speak to this and what this says about maybe Utah's primary system mm -hmm. and about the count my vote as well. I, I, my opinion is it's very positive. Uh, I think it opens up our elections. It makes them more available to people. Um, what we did is made it easier to get on the ballot or gave you multiple ways to get on the ballot and people are responding to it. So to me, it's, it's more choice, more competition, uh, better for the electorate. And I think it's just a matter of time before we don't talk about SB 54 anymore. I would wager that the election of John Curtis to Congress caused some conservative opponents of come about to rethink their position on signature gathering. I mean, we saw a candidate who did not do very well at the convention at all to then go on to win the race outright. It, you know, if you're hedging your bets, gathering signatures is a safe way to get to a primary. Ben, give a little bit more commentary to that. So it's Senator Deidre Henderson who chose mm -hmm. not to do signatures and loses mm -hmm. in convention, but could have done really well. Could have primary. won. I mean, yeah. I think it's is very... That, that's the main one you're thinking of? There's... Yeah, and then just John Curtis's performance in the convention as well, who yeah. barely registered among the delegates. And again, yes, uh, Deidre Henderson, it's very likely she'd be our congresswoman right now had she opted to gather signatures. Interesting. Nationwide, midterms are always really hard on a first president, a first term president, especially that ruling party. Damon, what are you seeing? Are, is this momentum that Democrats are trying to build up, will this, do you think that will be successful? I think it's really important. <clears throat> we have a, a, a long time trend, as you said, the, the president's party tends to lose seats in a midterm election. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump, uh, his level of popularity is low. The lower the level of the president's popularity, the greater the swing we tend to see. And then the real kicker is uh, when you have that kind of momentum behind one party, you will tend to see a lot more candidates, high quality candidates who strategically say, if I'm ever going to run, this is the year to do it. And you also see uh, Republicans uh, having a little bit harder of a time fielding candidates uh, to be competitive nationally. Uh, now in Utah, I don't know that the trend is necessarily quite the same uh, because a lot of Utah Republicans have, have strived to distinguish themselves or distance themselves from Donald Trump a little bit. And by playing that carefully, it may not have the same effect in Utah that it's had nationally, but things are shaping up to be a, a potential wave election for the Democrats. We could even see a potential uh, a complete change of both the House and Senate to Democratic control in 2018. Wow. Yeah, here in Utah, it's harder for some of those legislators to be really public about trying to distance themselves from the president. So do you think we'll see Democrats having a little more success in some of these state House and Senate races, Ben? It's hard to say. I mean, la during the last election, there were a few, a handful of seats that were within very tight margins. Uh, Representative Christensen, for example, won by three votes. That would seem to be a, the, the most likely flipped seat. Um, but like you said, I mean, the, the president is not particularly popular within the state. I think Republicans in Utah have a lot of ground to distance themselves, and it makes it that much harder for the Democrats to pin Trump on local Republicans. 
And what about in our fourth district? We've seen that Mia Love's been trying to distance herself from the president. Um, how will, how do you think that pans out? Well, I think it's interesting that her name's been being uh, suggested to run for the Hatch opening right. open seat. Right. You know, who knew that? Um, Morgan, I I wanted to comment on on Trump and midterm. If I can do that, just real of course, briefly. Please. Well, I just I just a thought, and that is, I have a lot of respect for the Utah electorate, uh, the intelligence of the electorate. I think whenever you have a president that's tweeting that we have a bigger and better nuclear button than New North Korea, that I think he's going to struggle in the midterm elections. So I do think it helps, uh, you know, co candidates that don't align with Trump. Okay. But that's just my opinion. Now back to, you know, Mia Love right. and John Curtis. Uh, really tricky, you know, because they, ha you know, it's not, they have to get reelected, mm -hmm. right? They have to, I mean, in their mind, the only way they can make a difference is if they're reelected. And to be reelected, I think they're going to have a tricky challenge. And I, I really uh, loved the Deseret News piece this week about the agony of John Curtis talking about the struggle of this pretty moderate person in a very conservative district. And Mia Love doesn't have that same dynamic, but she's got a tough challenger. She does. We'll, we'll watch that one closely. Well, when we talk about a potential wave in Utah, it, it would take more than a wave to flip control of the state. It would take a biblical flood. <laughs> it would. Now, where we might see that effect, though, is in the Mia Love Ben McAdams race. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the forecasters have switched to a lean Republican from a strong Republican. That might be a position where a wave would take effect in Utah. In the State House and State Senate, we, we have Republican control almost guaranteed. Well, and even in the past when we thought that was uh, the Math Matheson seat, the rating of that was still that the average Republican should win it by double digits. So it's get, get still such a difficult thing. Get ready for outside money to just flood into <laughs> our state on both sides, yeah. both for Mayor McAdams and for Congresswoman Mia Love. Yeah. The, the thing that makes this a little easier for me to love, I love Ben McAdams, a talented guy, rising star in Utah politics, no doubt. Uh, the thing that makes Mia Love, in my mind, a little bit harder of a target is that from the very beginning, she kept her distance from Trump. Uh, she, she was one of the handful uh, that refused to endorse. And she, I, I think, recognized uh, fairly early on that this was not a place that Utah voters uh, would support her going in that direction. Uh, and I think that gives her a little more protection in this particular race than she might have had if she had endorsed Trump. I uh, also wonder if some of her positioning is the fact that she's a woman. I, I think so, Yeah, absolutely. I want to spend the last few minutes of the show talking about our upcoming legislative session. And this, we have already a historic high number of bills that have been introduced and it's an election year. It's going to be a really interesting session. Um, but I want to hear from each of you, what will be the major issues? Ben, what do you think will be the hot topic? Well, I mean, my, my sphere of observation at the Tribune is education. And that's always a, a you know, a a hot topic. There's a lot of funding questions. And you mentioned the high number of bills. One thing we're seeing with education is most of those bills are not yet public. They're, there's a recodification effort going on that's mostly procedural. And until that is finished, most of the bills are being withheld. They're, they're drafted, but they're sitting where we can't see them. So midway through the session, we'll find out what lawmakers have in store for schools. And how complicated does this get by the fact that there is currently a ballot initiative regarding education funding? It doesn't uncomplicate things. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't expect lawmakers to be too concerned with our schools now. They've kind of taken a, a hands-off approach to let the initiative do what it's going to do. I mean, they'll, it'll come up and it'll be addressed, but I wouldn't expect them to be cutting deals or an SB 54 style compromise. I, I think the lawmakers will, will have their session in regards to education and then our schools now will, will do what they can do in November. Right. Natalie, what's the big issue? Well, I'll tell you what I'll be watching. I'm really interested in. So we have federal tax reform, this sweeping overhaul of the federal tax system, a $1.5 trillion tax cut to the American public. They changed the way you define taxable income when they did that, and we base our income tax system on the federal system. And so we don't know the exact number yet, but Utah will receive a windfall because taxable income got larger. You apply our same rates. We're going to get 100 to $200 million more income tax by doing nothing. So it'll be really interesting if the legislature decides to give that back to the state or to put it into education, because it'll be an income tax, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, seek a compromise with the uh, Our Schools Now people. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that, would, that would be a potential wrinkle, depending I don't on what know. the number is. It's, I don't know if it's big enough, but yeah. that's, that's going to be really interesting. And that, that you know, th there is already a bill that's uh, proposed to give that money back, and let's see what they do. All right, Damon. 
Well, I, I, I really like the way Ben mentioned the, uh, and, and, and you as well, Morgan, mentioned the initiative, uh, because I think many of the most important uh, legislative changes in the state of Utah in 2018 will probably take, be decided at the ballot box rather than during the course of the state legislative session. Which that, angers legislators to know it. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Uh, but... Uh, I think there will be a lot of smaller pieces of legislation. This will be a, a, a session, I think, where a lot of the changes are incremental but important. Uh, and that's where I see this one. But going. at the same time, it's an election year. And that's when we see bills come out that might not come out in other years, message bills, big, you know, headline-grabbing bills where lawmakers are trying to stake their claim on their constituency. So, does anyone's mm -hmm. guess? One thing that the legislature has dealt with in the last several years and has sort of struggled with because it's so controversial is mer medical marijuana and CBD regulations. And we have news out of Washington this week that um, Attorney General Jeff Sessions said they're rescinding some of those Obama era regulations that sort of took a lighter approach. So how do you think this affects um, the legislative session and those medical marijuana issues, Ben? You know, it's interesting. We've we've seen bills sponsored to make incremental steps, you know, for research on medical marijuana and s loosening some of the state restrictions. With this federal change, you might ex suspect that lawmakers will be more reluctant to do bills like that. But the initiative is moving forward, as far as we know. And like uh, Damon said, it'll be decided at the ballot box. And I can't imagine that supporters of the initiative are going to be too put off by this federal change. If, if anything, it might embolden them. Right. Damien, do you have any predictions on that initiative? Um, I, the, the initiative looks really, really popular right now. Uh, and I think the one unknown, the, the one thing that I think could generate the sea change in public opinion is if the LDS church takes some sort of position on mer medical marijuana. And interestingly, we're in a position where the, the next person in line to head the LDS church is a physician. Uh, and so uh, that, that change could have a lot of consequences for uh, what what could be a major issue uh, in Utah politics over the course of the next year. So interesting. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. That's it for tonight's show. The conversation continues online at KUED.org slash Hinckley Report. We will see you next week. Thank you and good night. <laughs>